there. Glad you could join me again this week. This message um, is why Satan tempted Jesus. And if you get to know why Satan tempted Jesus, then I think you can understand that if, in fact, which he did, Satan himself went to Jesus and tried to tempt him to commit sin, there has to be a reason for that. But if he would tempt Jesus, you're no problem for him, neither am I, right? We're only just regular little peon human beings. But this was Jesus Christ himself as an adult of 30 years old when Satan tempted him. But before I get to that, I got some good news for you guys because I always say that keep watching, keep listening, and as time unfolds, I'll show you how God continues to bless when you stay on his path and uh, follow his guidelines for your life. That is to say, you start each day out with your prayer, thanking God, you worship him by uh, knowing who it is that we're coming into his presence, which is the one who created this universe and who created you and me. And uh, then we thank him for things like meeting our daily bread needs and so forth and so on. But what I wanted to share with you were two great things that has happened in the past two weeks. One was, uh, as you know, I sing on YouTube, country music most for the most part, but I've been borrowing CDs from a fellow who was nice enough to loan me uh, some of his uh, vast inventory. So I would borrow them, I'd go up to where he works in the next town over, fortunately, I'm glad he didn't live in Ireland. Uh, that would be quite the trip. But the good Lord has been providing me with uh, machinery, uh, the CDs, he's given me the ability to build these studios that is just your imagination and mine, of course. But with the CDs, the, the fellow called me up a couple of weeks ago and he said, John, um, I'm going to be selling all my CDs. So I figured, oh boy, I'm out of business now because each time I have to get a song, I have to get it online and uh, then I have to type up the words to it and it just gets to be a long, I'll do it, but it gets to be a long, drawn-out thing rather than just drop a CD uh, in with words right there on my screen in case I need them. Uh, so a lot of that stuff's good. It's a great benefit. But here's what happens. He said, I want to sell them, and if you want to buy them, I'll sell them to you, John, for $300. Now, they had to be $30,000 worth of songs when he bought them. I think there were about almost 380, 480 CDs, which represented somewhere around, oh, 5,200 songs. A lot of them I couldn't use. I mean, they're like... People I, you know, Led Zeppelin and stuff. I don't do this stuff. Anyway, so I said, so I said, well, can you take $100 a month for October $100, November $100, and December $100, because I live on a budget, as many of you do. Uh, sometimes I come into money and sometimes I don't. Uh, in my past life, I, money was no object. If I had to write a check for 20 grand, no problem. But anyway, um, Long story short, so I took the chance because God puts a little bug in my ear, John, buy them. Offer him a hundred bucks a month for three months and uh, he'll take it. So I did and he did. So here we go, I get all the tapes in, which I have to bend over here and go off screen. But they look like this, they're just package after package of CDs. And I had three packs of these babies. Uh, that he handed me. So I separated out a hundred CDs that I would use and that would that's about 1200 songs that would last me believe me for the next three years. Um, but then the good Lord planted another little seed in my head. See this is how he works at least with me and uh, I got the bright idea well take 376 two cases of those keep the one case and put them on eBay and put them up there for $380. Now remember, I'm paying $300, $100 each month for three months. 
So I put them up for $380 and four days later they sold and I already shipped them to a nice fellow out in Illinois. Uh, but he got 380 CDs, which is some 4,000 songs, for the $380. That would cover my paying this fellow was $300 and it would also cover paying the shipping uh, cost to ship the stuff out to Illinois. So I did all that. I shipped it out, and the bottom line is this. Now, when the 300 comes in, I have a PayPal account, and they don't release till November 5th. But when that money comes in, it goes right into my bank account. Then out of that account, I'll take 200, go pay him the balance that I owe him, and the other 100 goes back into my bank account. And guess what? I still have 100 CDs, 1,200 songs that I got for zero when you figure it out that way. So that was one way that the good Lord opened up a window. Then I used two microphones. One is a handheld $50 microphone, which I use most of the time. Every now and then I like to use this other microphone that I paid $1,000 for 32 years ago. It's called the Neumann U47, but they're kind of a special studio type mic. Nice mic. But anyway, I said to myself uh, last night, which really means God put another bug in my ear. Go on eBay again, see what these mics are worth. I don't need it. <clears throat> you know, I could use a pellet stove in my house to heat the place this winter and a tank of oil, that's about a thousand bucks. So I figured I'd get my thousand back anyway. But I went on eBay and I saw those same microphones up there for between 2700 and 5000 depending on the age and condition. So I said to myself, self, take a shot. Put it up, that's at 9.30, no, 9 o'clock last night, which would have been uh, Halloween, October 31st. And you'll be listening to this on the weekend uh, coming up, November, whatever it is, 2nd, 3rd, I don't know. They all run together. <clears throat> so I decided I'm going to put it up there for $2,500. And, you know, and I put a little explanation, I don't need it. If somebody wants it, great. And I... Not in a thousand years did I think that it would sell. Within 45 minutes, somebody bought it and put the money into my PayPal account. So there's 2,500 sitting over there in my PayPal account, and I've already shipped that microphone out, which again, I don't use, but the guy that bought it in Los Angeles, California, will either turn around and resell it on eBay, probably get 4,000 for it, I don't care. I threw up a figure and they took it within 45 minutes. But to me, that's a blessing from God. It's just out of nothing he creates money or any resources that you need. So that will provide me with the resource of, I traded a microphone for $1,000 plus uh, a year's supply of wood pellets and a pellet stove, brand new. And I've already got the chimney and fireplace in my house, which I'm pointing like I have a studio here. but over next door is what I meant. Yeah, yeah, that's it in the house. All right, so anyway, those are two blessings that, to me, are like overwhelming, but they're confirmations that what I'm doing is the right thing, meaning singing on YouTube and then delivering a message to you folks on the weekend. That was the deal that I made with God, that God made with me when he gave me this voice on March 1st of 2011. So. He provided the resources, provided the, the machinery I needed, like the studio, uh, little mixing boards and stuff. The technology he gave me from a, a tough learning curve to build studios like this, to be able to sing in the first place, to get the CDs, and now a gift of over uh, 1,200 songs for free. Man, you can't beat it, plus another 2,500 materializing out of the air on a microphone that I used maybe five times a year. All right, so let's get into the message now about the evil one, Satan himself, why he tempted Jesus and why, beyond any shadow of a doubt, he's going to be tempting you on a daily basis. And Jesus teaches us how we can get rid of him, how we can make him go away, how we can make him leave us alone. Uh, but here we go, Matthew chapter 4, in case you want to follow around with me, there's a story that leads up to this. Jesus is now 30 years old, and the Bible says in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, I believe, that 
And Jesus, when he was about to step out into his ministry, begin his ministry, he was led up by the Spirit, that is God's Holy Spirit. He was led out into the wilderness where he would be tempted of the devil. That is to say, folks, that God the Father allowed Jesus and caused him by the Holy Spirit leading him right out into the middle of the wilderness and the desert to spend 40 days out there where Jesus would be fasting and praying to his Father because he was about to start his ministry. But he was led there on purpose by God the Father to be tempted of the devil. Nowhere in the Bible do you find that, that God allows you to be tempted. I mean, Satan can tempt us and all that, but God doesn't allow that to happen. He doesn't, meaning, meaning he doesn't on purpose say, go tempt that person, John Tyler, or you, or whomever. But Jesus had to be tempted. Here's why. Jesus was God. Remember, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's in John chapter 1, verse 1. John 14, uh, John 1, 14 says that that Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So here we are with baby Jesus born in Bethlehem in a manger. Um, he was born through the Virgin Mary, who was probably only about 13 or 14 at the time. And here's... Uh, Mary, but his father was God the Father in heaven. Through this, uh, well, most Catholics would call Immaculate Conception, Jesus was born. So here he is, half God and half man. Well, the man child, the man portion of Jesus, when he was uh, 30 years old, had to be tempted so that when he went to the cross, which was the plan and purpose of God the Father and of Jesus, he would go to the cross to die on the cross for your sins so he could forgive you and me of our sins. He died a horrible death on the cross. That was the plan, the plan of salvation. So here he is um, out in the wilderness. Here comes Satan, allowed by God to go and tempt him to see if he would fail or whatever, but that human side of him had to be tempted so that he would be found with or without sin. If with sin, if Satan could get him to commit a sin, then the whole salvation plan for you and for me would have been, went right down the tube. So picture it now. Here's Jesus. He's out in the wilderness. It's been 40 days. He hasn't eaten yet. Um, and if he found some water out there, I don't know if he brought some stuff with him. I don't know. All I know is he had nothing to eat during this whole time of fasting and praying to his father. Now comes Satan. Um, well, let me give you a little bit of history on the uh, why Jesus would come. And his sole purpose was to die on the cross for your sins and mine. Um, because in the Old Testament... The Jews, the nation of Israel, would everybody sins. You sin, I sin, they sin. But what the ritual, if you will, back in the Old Testament was that an unblemished lamb or a red heifer or something along those lines, but nonetheless an unblemished lamb would be sacrificed once a year. <clears throat> and the Jews still celebrate that. That's called the Yom Kippur or the day, the day of the year. The Day of Atonement. Atonement, I've covered this before, but just quickly it meant to take the sins of the nation of Israel, sacrifice that animal, that's a blood sacrifice, that's required by God. Don't know why, um, don't care really, because that's what God is God. And that's what was required. <clears throat> so the animal would be sacrificed for, on behalf of the nation of Israel, and the blood of that unblemished lamb would, once a year, on Yom Kippur, be used to cover up or atone for their sins for the period of one year. Jesus was coming to the planet so that he would become our sacrifice, blood sacrifice, not to cover over our sins for a year, but for once and for all, that sacrifice would appease, if you will, God, 
And, um, and that was the plan and purpose, that a human being, Jesus, a perfect, unblemished, without sin human being, would go to the cross, suffer, bleed, and die for your sins, and therefore he would be the only ones that could forgive you and me of our sins when we ask him to. Okay, so the man portion of Jesus, we're back to that, where Satan uh, gets to him and he's about to tempt him. But, before I get to that story too quickly, I have to tell you the parable of the ten lepers. Now, a leper looks like the guy on the screen behind me. His face is all like, what it is is your skin begins to rot. I covered this once before, but not in depth about the ten lepers. So, here, uh, here's the story about the parable of ten lepers. They were all, uh, their digits would fall off, their fingers would fall off, their nose would like rot and fall off, and eventually it was a neurological problem. Uh, let's see if we can call it, what do they call it today? Uh, Hansen's disease, H-A-N-S-E-N's disease. And that's what it does, it rots your extremities, and then eventually you die. And uh, it's not a pleasant death where it's a neuro neurological or all your nerve endings just get excruciating, say that word, will you? Excruciatingly painful. Then you die. So these ten lepers come before Jesus. They're, they're standing afar off, the parable says, because they had to raise their hands in the air and say, unclean, unclean, and they couldn't go near anybody. But they did yell out, um, when, they, when they saw Jesus, they said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. They had heard that he had healed a leper from his leprosy uh, some short while ago, and here's all ten lepers now. They want to get healed if they possibly can. So they said, Master, that didn't mean master like I'm your servant, I'm your slave. That meant teacher, rabbi, if you will. Uh, Jesus, teacher, uh, the one who's going around preaching and teaching. We heard about you. We know you can heal our leprosy, so have mercy upon us. What they're saying is, please, if you will, heal our uh, leprosy. So he said to the ten lepers, look, tell you what, you go and show yourselves to the priests in the temple. You start heading that way, and you, uh, by the time they got there, by the way, they were all healed of their leprosy. Now, one of the ten only one uh, came back to Jesus when he was healed on the way toward the priest. He said, I can't believe this, I'm healed. And he was so thankful that he fell at Jesus' feet and he, he glorified, he, it says in the Bible here, that in Luke chapter 17, 13 through 19, if you want to follow it, it says that one of the lepers, when he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice, he glorified God, which is Jesus. He said, I know who you are. You are the Son of God. You are everybody you said you are. You are the great healer, and I'm so thankful. Thank you. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and worshipped him, identifying out loud, really, what by worshipping Jesus, the God part of this God-man that was standing in front of him, he knelt down, worshipped him right there on the spot. And Jesus said to him, that uh, leper, he, who was a Samaritan, that's important too because the Jews hated Samaritans. And here he is, a Samaritan, being healed by a Jew in front of this great crowd of witnesses. And it was a big thing, a big deal for that day. And Jesus said to, to this leper, uh, when he picked him up by his hands and touched him and everything, all healed, um, he said, wait a minute, weren't, now this is the message he's trying to get to you and to me. Were there not ten of you? And yet only one, you, a Samaritan no less, came back to thank me, to worship me, and to uh, praise my name, and uh, you thanked me for healing you or cleansing you of your leprosy. So here comes the most important part of that story. Um, he picked that leper up and he said, you know what, thank you for coming back here, thank you for thanking me, thank you for identifying who 
uh, I am, and based on the faith that you had that I am He, who I say I am, the Son of God, the one who can heal and forgive sins, your faith in me has made you whole or complete. So the other nine lepers were completed as far as they were healed. He cleansed their leprosy, but they never came back and appreciated him, worshipped him, or thanked him for who he was. So they would just go through life cleansed of their leprosy. Here's the parable and the meaning of the whole thing is this. Jesus, when he went to that cross to die for your sins and mine, he died to cleanse the whole planet, every man, woman, boy, and girl, to cleanse us of our sins, just like those lepers. It's a free gift to mankind. He died on the cross to free you or cleanse you from your sins. But without taking advantage of um, what Jesus did for you on the cross and acknowledging who he is as the Son of God, as the only one who can forgive sins, because he would be going to the cross to die for your sins and mine, if we came back and thanked him and asked him to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of our sins, then we, he would have said to us the same thing he told that one single leper who came back, which is, your faith in me has made you whole. Whole meant the same thing as it means to you and to me. Your faith has made you whole. You came back, you worshipped me, um, you recognized who I am, you asked me basically um, to make you whole or save your soul, really. So that you would not only be cleansed from your leprosy here on the planet, but later on you will have eternal life because of your faith, because of your ability to recognize that I am who I say I am, the Son of God. So the whole parable here surrounds uh, a couple of things, really. One is, there were ten lepers. He gave the free gift of cleansing to all, just like he does to mankind. It's a free gift. <clears throat> the salvation is a free gift. All you have to do is come back to Jesus, thank him for it, repent of your sins, which means, I'm sorry for my sins, and then ask him, Lord, will you, will you save me from my sins? Will you forgive me? of my sins, will you save my soul so that I can spend eternity in heaven with you. All of this is on the salvation link below, by the way. So basically, the leper did it, but Jesus asked, were there not ten of you? And then there is a uh, verse in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, which clicked in my head, because it says that the roadway or highway to hell is very wide, and the gate is wide because many will choose to go down that road instead of going to and choosing to um, acknowledge Jesus and who he is and his ability to forgive, forgive us of our sins and save our souls and give us an eternity in heaven. It says in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, few there are that find that. And I'm drawing the analogy, can't prove it, but that Wide is the gate to hell where it leads to the lake of fire because so many people just reject what Jesus did like the 10 unthankful lepers, like the 90% of us that are unthankful. Um, but it's almost like, he's almost saying like, it's so narrow to get into heaven that only about 10% of the population on the planet will end up there. And 90% of all the population on the planet, if it's sort of like these lepers, that's why the road way the, the, is, um, to hell is, is so wide, because everybody chooses, or the majority, 90% of them perhaps, choose to stay on that road all the way till they die, and then their spirit ends up <clears throat> in this place called the lake of fire after God judges them. And, con and convicts them, if you will, using the Old Testament um, Ten Commandments. Have you ever lied, cheated, done this, done that? If so, then I have to punish sin. But there's a way out. And my son came and died on the cross for your sins so that you could have the way out, so that you could be forgiven for all your sins, past, present, and future. Did you accept my son? No. That's the unpardonable sin. That's why 
God at the great white throne judgment has to send maybe 90% of the population of the planet since day one into that lake of fire. That's a shame. I hope you join the 10%. Okay, so now we can get back to the uh, where Satan uh, comes up to Jesus. Now remember, Jesus is out in the wilderness and he's fasted for 40 days and he's hungry. Probably pretty thin too. He'd love to have a nice uh, meal right about now with a, some uh, freshly squeezed grape juice called new wine or some water or something. You know how starving you get after a, a day. I mean, I fasted and prayed for a day and I was already, I couldn't wait for the 24 hours to be up. And I pigged out after that. He's out in the wilderness 40 days. But think about it. He's really literally starving, the man part of Jesus. And uh, Matthew 4 verse 2 says this, he became very hungry. And the tempter, verse 3, Satan shows up. He comes up to Jesus and he says this, If you really are the Son of God, I want you to command these stones in front of you and turn them into bread so that you may eat. Now, his first temptation to Jesus or to us is always to get us to listen to him. And if we engage with Satan in this conversation and play with the stuff the thoughts he puts into our minds, like Eve did in the Garden of Eden, which I'll repeat that again. God said to Adam and Eve, if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the only tree I'm telling you to stay away from, don't touch it. But if you eat of that, you will surely die. And Satan says to Eve, well, no, surely you won't die. And the lie he told them, I'll repeat this as I go through message after message, the lie he told them is the same exact message that he tells you now. You're going to believe what God says or you're going to believe what I, the devil, says to you. <clears throat> and he talks to you all day long in your brain, on TV, in advertising, on the computer, whatever you do, you know Satan's right there talking to you. So here he is trying to tell Jesus, engage him in a conversation and say, well, turn these stones into bread if you really are. He's challenging Jesus. So that Jesus would say, oh yeah, well I'll show you who I am. And think about it. If Jesus did anything that Satan told him to do, that would be the, uh, excuse me just one moment. They always call me, don't they, during my little ministry time here. There's nothing I can do about it, I guess. But if Jesus had obeyed, Satan, because remember, Satan said, I'm telling you to do this. You turn those stones into bread and you feed yourself. So Satan's giving an order. Had Jesus listened to him and obeyed Satan, that would have been the sin. Period. But Satan's really got a game plan going on here. By the time I get into uh, a few more of these temptations, you will see exactly what Satan has been angling for all this time. And that is really to get Jesus to worship him. And he's trying to get you. That's what uh, Satan said to God. I want to be just like you. And when God made Adam and Eve, he says, wait a minute, they're worshiping you. I want some of that. That's what I want. I'm going to be just like you. Big fight went on in heaven with a third of the angels and Satan. And God threw him out of heaven, as you know, and he landed in Pergamos, Turkey which is why we still have turmoil over there in the Middle East, because that's where his throne is, Satan's throne, his headquarters. It says so twice in the book of Revelation. This is why I know stuff. Okay, so let me continue on. Look at these stones. You're hungry, you're starving. Turn them into bread. And Jesus says, uh, to Satan, uh, he quotes the Bible. He says, the Bible says that man is not, uh, man cannot live by bread alone, but by the word, every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And it's right here. So he's quoting the Bible back to Satan, um, which is exactly what to do. Uh, Matthew 4.4, 4, Jesus said to Satan, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, 
but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So, Jesus, who's also God and man, correctly straightened Satan out by quoting the word of God. I'm getting to that, which is what you should be doing too. And if you know the word of God, which means get in it and study it and read it, then you'll know exactly what to say to Satan to get lost based on the word of God, just like Jesus did. Jesus did not entertain him. He did not communicate with him other than quoting scripture to him. Jesus had to put him in his place, unlike Eve who started a dialogue and a conversation. Once you do that with Satan, you lose. He wins. No dialogue, no nothing. Satan, according to the word of God, according to what I know about Jesus, he told me, I can tell you, leave me alone. Depart from me. Go away. And then you can either pray. Here's what I do, and I told you this once before. I just say, you know, Satan, I'm going in to pray now, and I'm going to invoke the name of Jesus. Come on in, and you can pray with me if you want to. He's gone. I mean, you can feel him leave you. Believe me. Or if I'm in the car, I'll start singing hymns and, Hey, where'd you go? Hey, hey, where'd you go? Nowhere to be found. Uh, the Old Testament uh, man shall not live by bread alone. Jesus was quoting him out of Scripture, which is found in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 8 and verse 3. Okay, back to Matthew 4 and verse 5. Then the devil brought Jesus into the holy city of Jerusalem, and he set him high up on the pinnacle of the temple that was there in Jerusalem. And um, so imagine this now. Satan's got Jesus, the man, and God, combined, up on top of this very high pinnacle. And he says, if you really are the Son of God, then jump off this building, for it is written, God shall give his angels charge concerning you, and on their hands they shall rescue and protect you from landing on the stones below and killing yourself. Now you have to understand something. Satan's first attempt with Jesus was a commandment. Make those stones, turn them into bread, and you can eat. And Jesus quotes in the Bible out of Deuteronomy 8.3. No, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of God's mouth. So now Satan, who knows this Bible backwards and forward better than you and I will ever know it, he knows how to manipulate this word. He's trying to turn God's own words the audacity of this devil, Satan. But he tries to turn it around. He says, well, isn't it also written that the angels, if you really are the Son of God, the uh, God shall give his angels charge concerning you, and on their hands shall they rescue you before you hit the ground and burst asunder. Um, so he's now quoting the Bible to Jesus. Can you imagine it? But he'll use any trick in his... A book of tricks to get you to believe, even make Bible verses sound, oh yeah, I guess I guess that's right. That's why you got to know God's Word, folks. You really do. So that you know when somebody's twisting God's Word, trying to get you or manipulate you to do something. You just know, because God says, my spirit that is within you, who have asked my son to save your souls, from the place called the Lake of Fire, that same Holy Spirit that I put in you, who's staying in you until the time of the rapture, um, or until the time you die, absent from the body, is present with the Lord. That same Holy Spirit that's within you, Satan cannot occupy you when the Holy Spirit is occupying you. He can influence you, he can try to trick you, but the Holy Spirit says, my spirit bears record with your spirit, meaning you know when something's not right. You know when you're hearing the word and it's not coming back to you uh, right. You know when a red flag goes up like I told you last week, where some of these preachers even, they're on TV, red flags go up because they just get it wrong. So the second attempt that he tries is jump off that pinnacle up there and before you hit the ground, you can invoke uh, God's angels and they'll save you. Again, had Jesus obeyed Satan, to obey Satan is to commit sin. Once you are obedient to anything Satan tells you to do, you just committed a sin, and the whole salvation plan would have been gone. Again, 
So, uh, Jesus said to him, quoting the Bible again, he says, It is also written, You shall not tempt the Lord thy God. Now, that was sort of a slam the devil on the mat maneuver by Jesus, who obviously is God and he's man, so he's very, he's got God's intelligence and his wisdom within him. So he says, you shall not tempt the Lord thy God. And he wasn't telling Satan, don't tempt God the Father. He's really telling him, the Bible says, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And I am the Lord your God. And Satan knows it because Satan gets, uh, later on, uh, some demons were cast out. I think I might have said this to you last week. And they said to uh, Jesus, in case I didn't, I'll give you the quick story. Uh, Jesus was getting ready to cast demons out of um, a man and uh, a bunch of de demons came out and uh, people around him, around Jesus saw this and they said, this is a pretty good deal. We can go do that. All we got to do is cast demons out in the name of Jesus and maybe we can make a few bucks doing it. So they went up to a guy known to be possessed by the devils and they said to the demons within that man, come out in the name of Jesus. And they, uh, one of them I guess, came out and said to the, the men, well, wait a minute, we know the Apostle Paul, we know Jesus, we know who he is, but who are you? And I guess what they did was seven so-called preachers of the time, and they stripped those preachers naked and made them run through the streets of Jerusalem, just to totally embarrass them. So, um, my point is that Satan knows exactly who Jesus is. That's why he was trying to get him to commit a sin. He was trying to tempt him, tempt the man portion of Jesus, and he couldn't do it so far. Finally, he takes Jesus up to this very high mountaintop, and from that vantage point, they're looking down over the earth, the cities, the glitter, if you will, of the cities, and everything that's in front of Jesus and Satan. And he says, I'm showing you all the kingdoms of the earth and all the glory of them. And Satan says to Jesus, get this, all these things will I give you if you will just fall down and worship me. You see, that was what his intent was when he first came out to the desert to tempt Jesus anyway. Is if he could get him to obey, then he would have accused Jesus, you've sinned, now you got to worship me because you're a sinner. Just like everybody else on this planet. Jesus didn't fall for any of that stuff. All these things will I give you. Satan comes at you the same way, folks. It's always an enticement. That's his first line of attack. I'm going to entice you. Look a bangle, a bubble, a bead, something flashy, something really cool. I'm going to give it to you. All you got to do is worship me by, and how you do that is you don't get on the pathway toward heaven. Come on, I'll distract you with baubles and good looking stuff. He's a good looking woman over here and this stuff. Come on over. And off you go down a rabbit trail. Um, so that's what he tries to do is to entice you first. When that fails, by the way, then he just brings down all the hammers of hell upon you and he creates fear. Uh-oh, bills are due. Uh-oh, my daughter is going through difficult times and this is breaking, breaking my heart. And Why do these things have to happen? So he causes fear to get you off that path because you're so distracted by what your kids are doing or by what your husband's doing or by what somebody else is doing that you don't have time to get on and stay on that path toward God. When you do, He rewards you openly. He really does. Like I first started this out. Small stuff, like CDs, got them for free, 1,200 songs, or that microphone just sitting around, puts 2,500 into my wallet. I think that's fabulous stuff. I'm going to burn that thing next time, I think. So, if Satan can distract you, that's what he wants to do. But Matthew 4.10, Jesus wraps this up. 
And the whole message here is, why does Satan, why did he um, attempt to tempt Jesus? And if he did that to Jesus, you're, it's open season on you. And you should handle it the same way Jesus did. Jesus said to Satan, get thee behind me where you belong. You belong behind me, not in front of me. Because it is also written that you, Satan, shall worship the Lord your God, and only him shall you serve. And one day in the future, when God has his great white throne judgment, he's going to be calling Satan up in front of him, and Satan hates his guts, and he hates Jesus, and all those angels, a third of the angels that rebelled against God, that are chained in the second level of hell since the time of the rebellion, and that was when Adam and Eve were made, or shortly thereafter, uh, because there was no earth, remember? So they're in the middle of the earth, just above the lake of fire, but below this place called Hades, which is where those who did not trust Christ, they die and their spirits stay there, waiting for that, it's not purgatory, but waiting in Hades for that great white throne judgment. Then God calls everybody up there and says, if your name is not written in the Lamb's book of life, that is my son's book of life, then I'm afraid that you have to be, justice is going to be meted out now and you will be cast into the lake of fire. And uh, finally in verse 4, uh, chapter 4, verse 11 of Matthew, it says, finally the devil left Jesus and right after that exit by Satan, because he couldn't win. Jesus just brought the word of God back to him and shoved it in his face and basically told him, get lost. I am the Lord your God, and um, every tongue shall confess with that tongue, and every knee shall bow, including you, Satan, when at the great white throne judgment of God, whether he, God forces you or not, you will bow and acknowledge and say with your tongue that Jesus is Lord and Savior of uh, mankind, that he is Lord, he is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Imagine watching Satan have to say that in front of God, who he hates, and in front of Jesus, who he's hated uh, since he fell from God's grace out of heaven. So, then it says, the angels came and ministered unto Jesus. The second Satan was out, good things happen. Same thing will happen in your life, by the way, as long as you stay on that pathway. So my guess is that the angels brought Jesus his food and either that new wine or water or whatever, fed him, they ministered unto him, uh, you did a great thing here and oh, comforted him and all that kind of stuff. Um, so what I want to leave you with is the fact that Jesus offered himself that one time final sacrifice, the blood sacrifice, not to atone or cover up for your sins, but to forgive the sins of all mankind. All you have to do is don't be like the nine other lepers. Come back like the one did. Recognize who Jesus is. Recognize that he gave you the free gift of eternal life through forgiveness of sins, through your repentance, through asking him to save your soul, and he'll do it. It's a free gift. Heaven is a free gift. But you don't get it because you're just here on the planet. You have to come back like the one leper and ask him for that. Ask him to save your soul. Okay, so you've gotten that free gift. What are you going to do with it? Click on the link below. That would be great. So uh, that is the message. Hopefully this won't take that long. I can uh, get this done. I can get it organized. And I'll see you next week. Don't know what the message will be yet. Uh, but whatever God lays on my heart, I will share with you. And again, as good things continue to unfold, I've already promised you months and months ago that I will report in, however, if they're insignificant or significant. I think those two things that happened this week uh, or in the past two weeks are very significant, at least to me, that God takes care of my everyday daily bread needs. I don't hurt for anything. I don't need anything. He takes care of my daily bread needs. And uh, beyond that, every now and then he just throws a treat my way to say, see John, I'm, I'm continuously confirming that what you're doing, delivering messages, and then your thing which is singing on YouTube, 
uh, I gave you the tools that you need, I gave you the money to do it, you got all the CDs for nothing, I just handed you 2500 because um, one of my prayers was, you know, it's getting colder, oil is like $1,000 to fill up my tank, I like to have a wood stove, and so he just gave me the ability to fill up the tank and get the wood stove. So God's an amazing, amazing uh, God for us, and he wants to do the same thing for you. That's why every week I try to encourage you, do the right thing, get on his path, stay on his path, focus on his word, read it, understand it, ask him to open up your spiritual eyes so that you can understand it, and then go from that point on forward. And it's a great life. It's a wonderful life, like the Jimmy Stewart Christmas movie. It is a wonderful life. And there's a lot of blessings that God wants to give you. You just got to take advantage of it or stay on that big wide road that leads straight into the lake of fire eventually. I'll see you next week. Thanks for stopping by.